Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has lost control of the country. Invoking the Emergency Act confirms this. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. So yesterday afternoon at 4.30, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau emerged from his cave wherever he's been hiding out. He had been completely absent for most of the weekend as the third weekend of protests continued. He emerged and he let us know that he was, in fact, as reported by the CBC, invoking the Emergency Act. This is the first time this act has ever been invoked. It is a follow-up of the War Measures Act, which was used by his father during the FLQ crisis in the 1970s. Prior to that, the only time this has ever been invoked is during wartime, during World War I and World War II. So my colleagues and I at True North, we did a live reaction show yesterday. I was joined by journalists Andrew Lawton and Harley Sims, and we broke down exactly what was happening and gave our live reaction. So go check out that video because it has a lot of great information in it. So let me just reiterate this point. Justin Trudeau has lost control of the country. That's not an opinion. That is a fact. Declaring a national emergency, invoking the Emergency Act, means by definition that Justin Trudeau has lost control. Let me read from the Act. So here it is. It says, For the purpose of this Act, a national emergency is an urgent and critical situation of a temporary nature that A, seriously endangers the lives, health, or safety of Canadians and is of such proportions or nature as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with, or it seriously threatens the ability of the government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security, and territorial integrity of Canada, and that cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law of Canada. So does Canada right now meet that definition? Is the trucker convoy seriously endangering the live health and safety of Canadians to the proportion that it exceeds the capacity of our laws to deal with? Does the convoy threaten the ability of the government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security, and territorial integrity of Canada? Well, by no means is that the case. This is not a terrorist insurrection, it's not a siege or an illegal occupation, no matter what the CBC tells you. This, by contrast, is a block party. It is a family block party in Ottawa with music, street food, bouncy castles, and street hockey. This is what it looks like. Irregardless of what faith you're from, what caste, creed, religion, doesn't matter. It's about the community kitchen. We all eat as one and humanity is equal. So the Seva concept, helping the community is what we're practicing here today. We're here alongside the truckers in the fight for freedom and we're doing our part from the Sikh faith. And we welcome everyone to come and have some samosas, some tea and some french fries. These cheerful, patriotic, fun-loving Canadians do not pose a threat to national security. So why on earth is Justin Trudeau doing this? Is it because he does not have the law enforcement tools at his disposal to deal with the peaceful protesters and the odd act of civil disobedience? Well, let's examine those facts. The truckers have been in Ottawa for just over two weeks. They create a nuisance with their horns and with their trucks. And so, in response, Ottawa residents went to court, and a court ordered the truckers to stop honking their horns. The truckers complied, no problem, they stopped. Many of the truckers then left Ottawa, some headed to the Ambassador Bridge that connects Windsor, Ontario with Detroit, Michigan. This is an incredibly important trade route. It connects the auto industry. This one bridge represents about 25% of all Canada-US trade. Well, the truckers intermittently blocked the bridge. And as you can see, in real time, the Americans downplayed it. Here is US President Joe Biden's press secretary, Jen Psaki, downplaying the impact of the protest. She says it's causing sporadic congestion and blockades and causing minor disruptions. Here's what that looked like. Well, let me first start by saying I know there's been some suggestion, not by reporters necessarily at all, but that uh, this congestion is related to the vaccine requirements. It's not. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying I'm going to get to the protests, but the protests uh, going on across Canada, which uh, have spread to a bridge, are leading to sporadic congestion and blockages. So that was last Tuesday, February 8th, and then on Friday, February 11th at 7 p.m., there was another court injunction in Windsor, this time to clear the bridge completely. So according to a city news reporter who was there on the ground, this initially led to a bigger protest. So he writes this, the court ordered injunction at the Ambassador Bridge has kicked in and there's more protesters there now than at any point this week. They're streaming in by the dozens. It's hard to see the police stepping in at this hour with so many people here celebrating and carrying on. So again, these people are celebrating. These people are jovial and happy and patriotic and proud. They're not a menace. They're not 
They're not a threat. They're not posing a threat to Canada's national security. Another reporter, Sean O'Shea from Global News, was on the scene as well. He tweeted a long thread complaining that the police weren't breaking up the protests fast enough or with enough force. So he writes this. Observations from covering the Ambassador Bridge protest for the week. The actual protesters were loud, relatively few in number, professed defiance, but when pushed, all left without struggle. No weapons, no real pushback. And this is how it all ended. Police spent the rest of the day on the roadway asserting authority, telling people on foot to leave. They threatened to tow vehicles, including ours, from a shopping plaza lot. Then it snowed a lot. A few more arrests. By about 11 p.m., the bridge had reopened. So here is a clip of the force that they used in order to clear the bridge. Off the property, please. Off the property. Off the property. So it took some force. It took a little bit more than 24 hours, but the bridge was cleared. Crisis averted. Blockade removed. A few arrests, no violence, no injuries. That is a policing success. Our economy, an important trade route, and our border integrity remain intact. So why then, less than 36 hours later, would Justin Trudeau take such a drastic measure? Why would he use every single tool at his disposal as prime minister of the country to try to quell and squash these protests? Did something else happen? Well, there were a lot more peaceful protests over the weekend. Here's a scene in Ottawa. Now I want to walk you through this situation. The media disingenuously reported that protesters were moving the barricades around the war memorial so they could desecrate it. Here are some tweets saying exactly that. Abigail Brimham from Global News, she writes... Police set up barricades around the war memorial after the first weekend of the convoy protests, after incidents of people dancing and partying on the monument. Next, Mackenzie Gray from CTV wrote, Protesters have ripped down the barriers set up at the war memorial. They were up because people were using the war memorial as a toilet and jumping on the tomb of the unknown soldier. That's completely untrue, but regardless, Gord Miller jumped in from TSN. He wrote this, I've been honored to attend several Remembrance Day ceremonies at the National War Memorial in Ottawa, including the most recent one last November. To see this solemn place desecrated like this leaves me sad and angry beyond words. Next, Marikeem Walsh from the Globe and Mail wrote, In Ottawa on Saturday, police stood by and watched as dozens of demonstrators tore down the fence around the National War Memorial before gathering around the monument dedicated to Canada's war dead. So what did this horrible mob do? Why did they tear down the barricades? What kind of despicable desecration did they do next? What was it that left TSN's Gord Miller sad and angry beyond words? Okay, well, it turns out the people who removed the barriers were a group of veterans that wanted to pay their respect to Canada's war dead and to pray. Here is what they actually did. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There were no corrections from the media. They didn't bother to tell you what happened next. Look, there were plenty of people having a good time, partying, dancing, playing music. You and I may have seen this as a joyous act of patriotism, fun-loving Canadians claiming what is rightfully theirs, their freedom. They want their freedoms back, and what better way to take them back than to exercise them freely, defiantly, right in front of Parliament, the home of our democracy. You and I may see that as a beautiful thing, but you and I see things differently than the Ottawa establishment. They see it as sedition. Yes, sedition. That is what the former governor of the Bank of Canada, Mark Carney, the Liberal Party's current it boy, Mark Carney, that is what he called it in the pages of the Globe and Mail. Likewise, Bob Fife, who is the Ottawa bureau chief for the Globe and Mail, 
he called it anarchy. Here's his tweet showing a stage with people partying. Anarchy reigns in downtown Ottawa in front of our parliament. Horrifying, horrifying. Arrest them, demanded Althea Raj on Twitter. Althea Raj with the CBC and of the Toronto Star. See, the media continued to exaggerate what was happening in Ottawa and demand that the police round these people up and arrest them. These hypocrites suddenly claimed to care about small businesses being able to operate after spending two years telling us that we must remain under lockdown and that we must shut down small businesses all for the good of public health. After spending two weeks screaming and yelling about illegal blockades and demanding that the truckers be arrested for blocking roads, well, suddenly the same group of Trudeau cheerleaders were suddenly applauding a blockade. Yes, applauding a different blockade. A group of government employees, some waving their union's CUPE flag, descended from their million-dollar home in the neighborhood of the Glebe, an upscale Ottawa area comprised almost entirely of diplomats and bureaucrats, while they blocked the street to block the truckers. So this was a righteous blockade, and the Ottawa establishment cheered them on. Here's Bruce Anderson, a liberal pollster and former CBC talking head. He wrote, one victory at a time, showing a footage of this blockade. There were many more journalists cheering it on. Interestingly, this counter-protest rally featured evil flags, like that of the former USSR, a regime responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. There were hateful signs as well, like this one, where a radicalized Trudeau supporter wrote, kill the anti-vax. That's a bit extreme, don't you think? Well, if we've learned anything about how the legacy media cover large protests, it is that they always judge the entire group by the craziest people who show up. So if one guy has a hammer and sickle flag, the logic goes, that means that everyone in the group supports murderous communism. If one person in the group has a sign calling for violence and calling for murder, that means that the entire group condones political violence and genocide. That's how it works, right? That's the standard. Well, of course not. That's only the standard for people the journalists hate. People like you and me and the truckers. The pro-Trudeau counter-protesters are part of the Ottawa establishment. They're mostly bureaucrats. They believe in Trudeau's science, and you can tell because they're all wearing masks, even though they're outside, and, and even though most people now have natural immunity from Omicron. So of course, they get away with saying the craziest things, and the media completely give them a pass. But the protests are no longer just in Ottawa. They have spread across the country. Here's a scene in beautiful British Columbia outside the provincial parliament building. Brian Peckford, the former premier of Newfoundland and the last living signer of Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, joined the Freedom Convoy and gave an incredibly powerful speech about what it means to be Canadians and what our Charter of Rights actually means. Here is what that looked like. And we're not going to allow this nation on the northern part of North America to go down the drain because we have people who've gotten hungry for power and have discarded the individual freedoms that you and I own. They are ours. There's none two of us the same. That's why individual rights and freedoms are so important, right? Because it's you as a person, you as an individual, not you as a family, not you as a group, Okay? Not you as part of some other organization, not you as part of the province. It's you as an individual Canadian. Possess these rights. That's what's important. He's absolutely right. So these protests continued in cities across the country. They were peaceful, they were positive, they were patriotic. And this time, there were no evil flags, so Trudeau could no longer simply dismiss the entire group as Nazis. So what did Trudeau do? Well, he invoked the Emergencies Act, the most sweeping set of powers available to a prime minister, the act that replaced the War Measures Act. This came just 18 days after he dismissed the movement as a small fringe minority. So why did Justin Trudeau do this? Well, I think there were three reasons. One, to appease the Ottawa establishment and delight his friends in the media. Two, to crack down on decentralized crowdfunding, and three, to compel the police to do his dirty work. Let's go through those three reasons right now. So the first reason, appeasing the Ottawa establishment. The loudest and most deranged critics of the convoy throughout the entire process have been the legacy media journalists in Ottawa, the parliamentary press gallery. Last night, after Trudeau invoked emergency powers, 
for the first time since the FLQ crisis, an actual crisis in the 1970s where domestic terrorist separatists were bombing buildings, kidnapping cabinet ministers, and murdering people. Trudeau invoked it. And how did the media react? What did they do? Well, first, they hosted a Twitter space hosted by the Canadian Association of Journalists called this, I kid you not, the mainstream media versus the trucker convoy. They aptly pitted themselves against the convoy plain as day in case you had any doubt about what side they were on. I listened to a bit of the panel as much as I could stomach, and the focus wasn't on Justin Trudeau's excessive power grab. It wasn't by the excessive use of force, the abuse of power, the unprecedented nature of using this act. No, they didn't talk about that at all. Instead, they focused on how journalists were the victim, how they had to deal with mean people on the internet, and how some people were starting to question their authority. It was so pathetic. What a farce. On top of their own pity party, many journalists were actively turning into Liberal Party fact-checkers. So the New York Times correctly reported that Trudeau was suspending civil liberties. This is what the New York Times wrote. Declaring a national public order emergency is Trudeau's most aggressive response since the crisis began. The move will allow him to temporarily suspend civil liberties to reopen border crossings and clear the blockade of about 400 trucks in Ottawa. Well, immediately, the establishment journalists called foul. Rosemary Barton angrily tweeted, this is completely false. In no way does this suspend civil liberties. Good grief. Likewise, Gerald Butts writes this. He says, this is incorrect, New York Times. The charter is specifically upheld in the statue the government is invoking. Well, the New York Times dutifully deleted the tweet and issued a correction. They wrote this, correction, an earlier tweet incorrectly suggested that Trudeau would temporarily suspend civil liberties. We deleted the incorrect tweet. How was that incorrect? I don't understand. Peter McCraffy, who runs a civil liberties think tank over in Calgary, he wrote this. They can close your bank account and seize your assets without a court order. That's literally the definition of suspending civil liberties. How are these people the ones reporting the news? Great question, Peter. Of course, he's right. Peter is right. But the journalists don't want anyone to know, especially Americans, especially readers of the New York Times, they don't want them to know how bad things have gotten in Canada and how much Trudeau is abusing his power. So they lie to protect their man. Here is what the Emergencies Act actually does. This is according to a Globe and Mail summary. Under the law, the federal government will strengthen police powers to impose fines and imprison people, compel tow truck companies to help clear blockades, allow banks to freeze the personal and corporate accounts of individual protesters without a court order, and subject crowdfunding companies to anti-money laundering and terrorist financing rules. And again, in case you had any doubt, here is a clip of Finance Minister Christia Freeland explaining just exactly how they will suspend your civil liberties. Here's that clip. As of today, a bank or other financial service provider will be able to immediately freeze or suspend an account without a court order. We are today serving notice. If your truck is being used in these illegal blockades, your corporate accounts will be frozen. The insurance on your vehicle will be suspended. Send your semi-trailers home. So they just repeat over and over again that what you're doing is illegal. They start calling you terrorists. And soon enough, the laws start to apply to you that way. It's all pretty terrifying. This brings us to the second reason why Trudeau is doing this, to crack down on conservative crowdfunding. You see, just like how the court orders successfully stopped the honking and cleared the Ambassador Bridge, Trudeau already possesses the power to shut down crowdfunding. They did it to GoFundMe, who caved easily to the slightest bit of political pressure and stole $10 million from the truckers. Initially, they said they were going to redirect it to charities of their choosing. Then they decided to just issue refunds. Well, likewise, when an alternative fundraising campaign began under a site called Give, Send, Go, an alternative to GoSendMe, they also raised $10 million, and that money was also stolen, this time by an Ontario court. About a million dollars of that money had already been distributed to the truckers, but then it was reported that TD Bank, again using the help of an Ontario judge, froze the bank accounts and stole that money too. So the money isn't even getting through to the truckers. So why would Trudeau need to invoke emergency powers to stop this? Well, because the truckers are one step ahead. They started to look at decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin as a way to raise money. And the government has no control over this area by design. The whole purpose of cryptocurrency is that it's decentralized and is not controlled by the government. Well, this was not good enough. So Justin Trudeau and Christia 
Freeland are using the full force of the Canadian government to stop their political opponents from being able to raise funds. This is very scary, unprecedented stuff. Finally, the third reason why Justin Trudeau is doing this, to compel others to do his dirty work, to compel them by force to do his dirty work. The police are not arresting people fast enough for the Ottawa journalists and the Ottawa establishment. Journalists have spent weeks now screaming and protesting and complaining on Twitter that the police are not arresting the people that they want arrested. The tow truck companies, likewise, have said that they simply refuse to tow the trucks. Why? Well, because they agree with the truckers. They're out there with the protesters. They're celebrating their part of the movement. They, too, want their freedoms back, as do many police officers. Did you see this clip over the weekend? It triggered many, many Canadian journalists. Many of them were angrily shouting about this and saying that this shows that the police are not doing their job. But to me, all it does is simply show that many police officers don't want to arrest the protesters because they agree with them. Here's that clip. I support you guys 100%. Thank Thanks, you. Man. All right. That's what we like to hear. So, awesome. I haven't been to Ottawa. A lot of us are. Yeah. For nothing but great things for our protesters. Yeah. Everybody's Wonderful. Very, very thankful. Yeah. Uh, we we just keep her sure peaceful. That everybody's good. And when yeah. you got these lights going, you're causing a lot of confusion on the road. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wait till you get there. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> So we have truckers, some police officers, some members of the Canadian Armed Forces, and the tow truck operators all on the same side. They're all culturally aligned. They don't like Justin Trudeau. They don't agree with heavy-handed emergency measures. And they're showing their own form of civil disobedience by non-compliance. Well, Trudeau is furious about this. He knows the truckers will never support him. He's already smeared them. He's maligned them. He's gone too far, and they will never forgive him. But the problem for Trudeau is that his own side, the Ottawa establishment, is starting to turn on him. Trudeau has been absent. He's been hiding. And whenever he dares to show his face, he looks angry. He looks a little deranged. He looks divisive. He smears his enemies. He makes everything worse. That's why only 16% of Canadians say that they would vote for him right now. And even those who oppose the Freedom Convoy, even the people who support Justin Trudeau and his mandates, they say that Trudeau is the most to blame for the situation getting out of hand. Trudeau is the most to blame. So Trudeau needed to do something. He needed to show some power, show some force. He needed the protest to end. He needed them to end right now. So here he is announcing that he will now compel tow trucks to do his dirty work. One of the issues that we have seen is a challenge in uh, getting tow trucks to actually show up to uh, bring out, to, to move these large rigs in, uh, in Windsor. Uh, we relied on uh, generous partnership with the Americans uh, to be able to get tow trucks to move the big trucks. Um, now, with these measures that we've put in place, there will be an ability to compel, for just compensation, tow truck owners and operators to actually do the jobs for which they have contracts with various orders of government to keep highways and roads clear. Trudeau said that this was his last resort. Interesting, isn't it? Trudeau refused to meet with the truckers. That could have de-escalated the situation, but he refused. He could have voted symbolically to come up with a timeline to drop COVID restrictions, since that's ultimately what the truckers want. It would have shown a willingness to listen, to compromise, and to work across the aisle. The conservatives introduced a motion asking for just that, and Justin Trudeau voted against it. Here is an Ottawa establishment journalist, David Aiken, who is the bureau chief over at Global News, and he is making this exact point. He writes this on Twitter. I thought that the Conservative Party of Canada was making a very reasonable proposition to the government, asking it to table a plan before February 28th, explaining how and when federal vaccine mandates would end. Not to end the mandates, just a plan to end them. The Bloc and the Conservatives voted for it. The NDP and the Liberals voted against it. it I should note that Liberal MP Joel Lightbound voted with the Conservatives and voted in favor of this motion. Well, instead, Trudeau voted against it. He refused to budge even an inch. So instead, he says he's willing to wage war against peaceful protesters, against moms and dads, against people barbecuing, kids jumping in bouncy castles, people playing street hockey, and impromptu dance parties on the streets in Ottawa. Trudeau announced two weeks to flatten the protesters. It's a huge gamble because it could lead to even more civil disobedience and even more protests, or even worse, it could lead to violence, to very real violations of human rights and civil liberties here in Canada. Don't expect the legacy media to report the facts or tell you the truth. They're too busy cheering on their man, Justin Trudeau. 
True North will be there on the ground every step of the way, giving you wall-to-wall coverage to report on this unprecedented abuse of power. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.